man, it's been a while since I've been up here. I truly miss you guys. How's everyone's week been? Oh, uh-oh. Okay. That was a mixed uh, bowl of reactions. Anybody want to talk about it? No, just kidding. Okay, well, hey. So to kick things off tonight, I need three volunteers. Three volunteers. Dylan, come on up here, dude. You just, you handsome fella. Uh, yeah, come on up. Yeah, that'll work. One, yeah, you know what, Andrew, get on up here. We'll do a battle of the brothers here. Come on up. Come stand behind the table here. <clears throat> are are y'all terrified of this right now? Absolutely not. Yeah. yeah, okay, good. They're not even sealed. That's how you know they're the good kind. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to see who can eat the most toothpaste. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, I would get so many emails. So what we're going to do is we're going to see who can empty out their tube of toothpaste the fastest, okay? However, here's, here's the thing, okay? Um, please just keep it on the plate, okay? Just on the plate, okay? So on the count of three, you're going to pick it up, open it up, squeeze all of it out as fast as you can, okay? On your mark, get set, go. Let's see who, let's see who pulls in the win here. Nice, nice. Oh, this is going quick. Let's see, oh, who's, who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? Oh, this is coming down to the wire. This is better than playoff basketball, you guys. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, I, I think Dylan just has the win. Dylan Cawthorn, everybody. Can we give it up? All right, now, now don't worry. Don't worry, okay? There's another opportunity to win, okay? Again, keeping it as neat as possible. Yeah, I need you to put it all back in that tube as quickly as possible. On your mark, get set. Keep it on the plate, my guy, all right? On the plate, yeah, it's disgusting. On your mark, get set, go. Just get it all back in there, yep. Go ahead, yeah, everybody, yeah, everybody. Come on, you gotta put it back in, come on. You gotta put it back in, Andrew, come on. Don't, 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 no, don't be, get, don't be acting crazy on me now. No, that's okay. Come on, put it back in there, go ahead. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta put it back in. No. Yeah, back, back in the tube. How's that going? Good? You close? Oh, very good. No? Oh, okay. Yeah, Dylan, just quit while you're behind my cat. You nasty. All right. You can, you can give it up for our contestants. Thank you very much. you can go grab a seat, wash your hands, whatever's necessary. Y'all, it smells minty up here. Okay. This is, this is, this is something else. Um, so most of y'all know the analogy, right? How easy was it for them to empty the tubes? Pretty easy, right? It took, what, 10, 15 seconds for them to empty it out? How hard was it for, to, for them to put it back in the tubes? Impossible, right? So what we're learning about tonight in James chapter 3 is, uh, man, that's exactly how, how words work. Once you say something, it can never be taken back fully. Once the words leave your mouth, you cannot take it back. We're looking at the pressure of language tonight. It's going to be James chapter 3. We'll be in verses 1 through 12. And so in James chapter 3, what we're going to learn and what we're talking about is taming the tongue. And we're going to see how James talks about the power of our words and the effect that they have and how they should reflect the condition of our heart. And so I'm going to pray for us and then we are going to jump right into James chapter 3. Let's go before the Lord. Father, Lord, you are good. You are a God of truth. You are a God of grace, um, a God of mercy, but you're also a God that instructs and gives us your, your holy word to follow and to listen and to adhere to and to learn from. And Lord, I pray that tonight that would be the case, that we would listen, that we would learn. Um, Lord, would you convict us where we need convicting? Lord, would you show us grace where we've fallen short? And Lord, ultimately, would you use this message and this time to further your kingdom and to further our affection of you as individuals and as a body of Christ. And Lord, ultimately, whatever is from you, um, Lord, would it take root? Would it convict? Um, would it change lives, Father? And Lord, what is from me? Would it fall on deaf ears? Lord, would you just fill this room with your spirit? Would you communicate through me to your children tonight? Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone that loves Jesus said, amen. amen. We're gonna be in James chapter three. If you have your Bibles, turn there. If you have your devices, go there. Yeah, go there? Yeah, we'll say go there. If you have your devices, go there. James chapter 3, 
verses 1 through 12. I'm going to read it, and we're going to jump right in. This is what it says. Not many should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is mature, also able to control the whole body. Now, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, and we direct their whole bodies. And consider the ships, though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, whether the will of the pilot directs, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though, the tongue is a very small part of the body, but it boasts great things. Consider how a small fire sets ablaze a large force, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of unrighteousness is placed among our members. It stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and fish is tamed and has been tamed by humankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way? Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives? My brothers and sisters, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a saltwater spring yield fresh water. So our first point, we're diving right in. Point one, found in verses one and two of the passage, everyone stumbles. Everyone stumbles. Everyone has a struggle. Everyone has a sin. Everyone stumbles. Stumbles And the ancient Greek word translated for stumble does not imply a fatal fall, but something that trips us up and that hinders us in our spiritual progress. And so we, we stumble in word. We stumble uh, about ourselves. We stumble with our arrogance or when we exaggerate a circumstance or when we tell a white lie or when we're selective in the information that we share or that we don't share. We stumble in the word about others with our criticism, with our gossip, with our, our cruelty, when, we, when we're evil, when we wish bad things upon people, when we curse those that object us, when we're two-faced, whenever we say we're someone that we're not and when we act like we really care about this person until we're away from them and then we tell other people that we really don't like them that much, when we're angry or with flattery, whenever we're, whenever we're giving false compliments or fake compliments or trying to just pump someone up, and with insincere words meant to gain favor. Whenever there's something that we want from someone else. You know who's really good at this? My daughters, okay? Fantastic at doing this very thing where they make a bad choice. We talk about the, 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 the bad choice and then they walk up to me and they go, well, daddy? I'm like, yes, baby. I'm like, I love you. Well, thank you, I love you too. Can I have a cupcake? Every time. I'm like, no, you may have a cupcake but I said I'm sorry. Right, but that doesn't mean you get a cupcake. Fine. And then they're mad about it, right? When we do these things, we have stumbled. We are wrong. We are sinful. So where have we gone wrong already today? Because we came into this room and we started worshiping our Father and saying, come, awaken your people. That all will cry out, hallelujah. We sang these very words, but I, I can guarantee that everyone in this room has misspoken in some way today, whether it was towards a friend, about themselves, towards a family member, on the way to school, on the way to class, on the way from school, on the way into this building. We have stumbled today. We stumble in cursing and crude jokes. Everyone stumbles and we stumble often. In this passage, I don't want you to mishear this point that, well, if everyone stumbles, it's okay. This is just my sin struggle because I don't think that's the heart of James in this at all. We shouldn't be okay with it. And what James is doing here is painting a picture and trying to show that the significant standard that we are held to as believers. And in verse one, he's really talking about teachers and pastors and how when we get to the gates of heaven, we will have a lot more to answer for. But then further down, he paints it for all believers. He said, for believers, this should not be so. And I think he's also trying to remove the excuse of self-righteousness. Well, well, I don't, I don't have this problem or I don't say these things or I don't talk about those things and so my, my, tongue, my, my, my tongue is tamed, tamed. And it's not. 
It's not about whether or not you control your tongue because we see later on that no man can tame the tongue. And so it's not a matter of if you tame it or not. It's just a matter of how you lose the fight. And so this opening verse is really just trying to remove the self-righteousness and the excuse of this isn't for me to listen to. And he says, no, this is really for everyone to listen to. And so he's really just evening the playing field. Everyone stumbles. It's just a matter of with what? And then in our second point, the tongue can build or it can destroy. It can build up or it can tear down. And we see that in verses three through eight, which say this, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Look at the ships also. They have, they're so large and they're driven by strong winds and are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. And then you see he goes into this illustration of a fire. How many of y'all remember the wildfires in California like four years ago, yeah? Do y'all know how those were started? Gender reveal party, yeah. It was just like a little bit of pyrotechnics and an ash from a burned piece of confetti drifted into a dry piece of grass and burned up hundreds of millions of acres of land. That's exactly what he's talking about. How, how do fires begin? By very little embers. And so our words, they can, they can build up, they can tear down, they can, they can give life or they can take life. Do we view every word we say as a potential ember flying into a forest? Do we view our mouth and when we speak and, and when we take our thoughts captive as Rance has talked about, do we view the words that we're saying as something that, that dictates and controls the direction of our day, the direction of our thoughts, of our happiness, of our prayer life, of our contentment and of our witness? Or do we think, well, it's just a group of friends that know me and so I can, I can say these things or I can talk about these things or I can engage in this language. It's not a big deal right now. Because the, the bit that goes in a horse's mouth is very small compared to a horse. And a rudder compared to a ship is very, very small. And I'll give you an example of a rudder of a ship, okay? I was on one. The anchor that we would drop into the ocean, you ready for this? Weighed 25,000 tons, okay? It's a big anchor. The rudder on the ship weighed 4,000 pounds. That's crazy. That's the size difference, Okay? And so when we're talking about the mouth, and, 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 uh, and if you think about just the anatomy of the body, the mouth is a very small piece of your body, yet it dictates and directs so much. And here's the thing, you don't solve the problem of a horse that doesn't listen by just putting it into a barn until it changes its mind. You don't fix the problem of a ship that is hard to steer by keeping it in the dock. And in the same way, we just can't keep silent to avoid going to these places. And the ultimate answer for the misuse of our tongue is not silence or talking less. And if the parallels to the tongue that we see painted in the scripture are to the, the bit of a horse or to the rudder of a ship, both of those things mean that someone else is controlling the direction. The captain of a ship, the owner of the horse or the trainer of the horse it is a small piece that someone else uses to direct the direction of the object. And so a question for you is who or what has control over your speech? Who dictates your speech? Who controls your speech or what controls your speech? Is it a, a certain friend group that just gossips a lot or talks about other people poorly that then you begin to feel safe engaging in that type of conversation? Is it a group of guys at the gym always checking girls out where you believe it's okay to begin talking about women as objects and not as human beings? Is it a certain type of music that you listen to that as you listen to this music, you begin to actually repeat the lyrics that you would not normally say out loud? Or maybe you don't have any control over your speech. Maybe there's nothing that controls your language or nothing that controls what comes out of your mouth. There's no moral compass. There's nothing that you weigh what you say against before it exits your mouth. And then you're left with a plate of words that you can't take back and you're going, what have I done when they start to catch up with you? And so think about it for a minute. What or who has control over your speech? 
What do you think about? What do you weigh it against? What crosses your mind before you speak? And as you sit there and think about it, if nothing comes to mind, then that's probably a really good indication that you, in fact, have no control over the way you speak, in the way you communicate, in the language that you engage in, in the, the, the weight of your words. It means that you just don't, you simply just don't comprehend it. The Bible, and specifically James, is pointing us to a life of the Holy Spirit having permission to work through us, giving us the ability to take control of our tongues. Because you've heard me say it before, the good news about every time we speak is you can't fix it alone. It's not about trying harder or doing better or just mustering up the courage or, or having alarms on your phone to remind yourself. It is simply having the ability and the faith to go before the Lord and say, Father, like, I can't do it. Like your scripture tells me that it is impossible. And so I need you to work through me and my heart and my life to make it possible. Would you make me mindful of my thoughts? Because thoughts become words, words become actions Actions become habits, and habits would dictate the direction of your life. And so when, whenever you hear, whenever you heard Rance speak about taking every thought captive, well, now this translates, and this was not planned, but it does translate into your speech. What you think about is what you talk about. What you talk about is what you start to take interest in. And so you see this very slippery slope down this path to sin and justification and you've heard me say it before, it's like a fish swimming upstream. As believers, we swim against the current of the world. And the moment that you stop going against it, even if you're not actively turning around and engaging in it, you will naturally coast back down. And then one day you'll look around and wonder how you've fallen so far from your walk with the Lord. And here's the final point, And this is the one that we're going to sit in. The tongue tells the truth about our heart. The tongue tells the truth about our heart. The tongue can be used for the highest of callings, which is to worship and exonerate and glorify the Lord. And it can also be used for the lowest of evils, to curse men. But we see it. We see it in the, in the end of the passage. Starting in verse 9. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Let's just think about that for a minute, that everyone in this room, everyone that you come in contact with, everyone that you drive past, everyone that you don't like, everyone that walks this earth was made in the likeness of God. Do we talk about them in such a way? Do we look at them in such a way? Do we respect them? Do we have the reverence for them? Or do we pick and choose God's creation that we're going to tolerate, that we're going to do life with, and that we're not going to do life with? But then it says, from the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. And then he paints this beautiful picture. Does the spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and and salt water. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or can a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. If we are a believer, it should not be the case that blessing and cursing both come from our mouths. It is that simple. Our speech should be consistently glorifying God. We shouldn't use one vocabulary when we're in church and then a different vocabulary when we're at school or with friends. And in fact, James says that it is impossible for both to be true. And so if scripture tells us that it is impossible for both to be true, that it is impossible for you to bless the Lord and curse others. Then our tongue tells us the truth about our heart. And so if you want to know where you stand with the Lord, and if you want to know where your heart is with the Lord, evaluate your speech. What you talk about, what you think about, the way you communicate, the way you talk about other people. The way you communicate, the way you speak in your mind. These words may not even leave your, your mouth, but if 
We all, we all talk in our heads, right? Or I'm just, I might be crazy, but I'm pretty sure we all do. But if, it, if it's impossible, if salt water is flowing from the stream of your mouth, then fresh water cannot be present. If cursing is coming from your mouth, then blessing cannot also flow from it. And it shows that the truth of the heart isn't one of honoring the Lord, but of serving the world. And so how's our speech? How's our speech when we're angry? How's our speech when we're happy? How's our speech whenever we're around a good group of friends and our guard comes down a little bit? And how's our speech at church? You want want to know something crazy? Whenever Peter denied Jesus three times, most of y'all know that story, correct? Yes? All right. So we know the story where Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And he says, absolutely not. That's never going to happen. And then he's, he's in the room as Jesus is, is going to trial and people recognize him and say, hey, aren't you one of his followers? And he says, no, I'm not one of his followers. And then it says that time passed and someone else is like, no, you, you're definitely one of his followers. And he says, no, I'm not one of his followers, the third time that he denies Jesus, the way he got them to believe that he wasn't was by cursing. If you read it in the Greek and the Hebrew, it said that he, he spoke and that word spoke meant that he cursed. And after he cursed, they believed that he was no longer a follower. And then the rooster crows and Jesus looks at Peter and he realizes what he's done. But the way that Peter could convince a group of people that he was not associated with Jesus Christ was in his speech. Do we start to see the weight of it? The heaviness of it? The magnitude of it of how such a small piece of our life and something that we do so often can so directly impact your ability to witness and your ability to worship. The power of poor language and not controlling your tongue can be detrimental to your ability to share the gospel. The way that you control your tongue can be detrimental to your ability to be thankful. It can be detrimental to your ability to have gratitude. It can be detrimental to your ability to surrender. Because if you're not speaking it, what you speak comes from your heart. And so if all you're speaking is negativity, I'm not saying just focus on positive vibes. I'm talking about true, heartfelt gratitude and thankfulness and love for the people around you. If we're not speaking those things, then those things are not inside of us. It is impossible for you to glorify the Lord and to curse others at the same time. So where is our speech? You can't label a fig tree an olive tree and it will make it an olive tree. You can't trim a fig tree to look like an olive tree and that will make it an olive tree. You can't treat a fig tree like an olive tree and then it's gonna start producing olives and you can't surround a fig tree with many olive trees and make it an olive tree. You can't even transplant a fig tree to an olive tree farm and it start producing olives. You can't change the interior of something. And so what does your speech tell you about your heart? What does your speech tell you about the way that you treat others? Carson, what does it say? It's a duck. Amen, bro. So good. Thanks, bro. If it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. If it talks like it's angry, if it acts like it's angry, if it talks like it doesn't love the Lord, then how can it love the Lord, right? You heard Rant say it on Sunday. If you squeeze an orange, can apple juice come out of it? No, orange juice comes out of it. What does your heart tell you? What does your speech tell you about your heart? What does your heart tell you about your speech? It's an honest question. So I have an illustration. Oh, I don't know if it's gonna work. Whew, okay, here we go. This is most of us on Sundays, Right? We come in, we say that we love the Lord, we wanna honor the Lord, we wanna serve the Lord, we worship with our hands raised and we confess openly with people in our community groups. But then we leave, right? And pressure starts happening 
and people around us start cursing and then there's a group of guys that tell you to check out a girl on the way down the hallway and all of these start happening and you start speaking, what is it that comes out? Right? Food dye, correct. Very good. But if you say that you're an orange and that you love the Lord, but then you get squeezed and orange juice doesn't come out, then you can't say that you're an orange. If you say that you love the Lord and that you are honoring the Lord and that the Lord is your God and he dictates everything in your life, but then whenever you speak, it doesn't show that, then where do you really stand with the Lord? If you say, Holy Spirit, like sin revival, like come awaken your people, like the God of revival, like pour it out, and then you leave this room and you start talking trash about other people then I don't think you really want the Lord to bring revival. And so the posture of our heart, is it different in this room than it is in a different room? The way that you communicate and speak with friends in this room, is it different than the way you communicate and speak with other friends? The way you worship in this room, is it different than the way you listen and respect your parents at home? Because what is inside will come out. And there's a really good gauge for this. Are are you tired when you leave church? Are you tired of having to to control your language and hope you don't say certain things or hope you don't act certain ways? And it's a really good indication that this isn't your true authentic self. And so where are you with the Lord? I'm gonna pray and we're gonna go into circles. It is a fam night and this is something that I want you to discuss, to confess and to just have the ability to really think through and talk about. This is a a very big topic. And so if you call yourself a believer, I challenge you to think through your day and confess with openness where you stand, where where your speech would show your heart position being. And so let me give you your, your small group circles real quick. Oh, this is kind of confusing. Whew, okay, seventh and eighth grade boys. Y'all are with Ethan and John, and y'all be right up over here in the front. Seventh and eighth grade girls, y'all are with Emily. Emily, there she is. Y'all wanna gather right up over here in the front. And then ninth grade dudes, y'all are with the one, the only, the beardless wonder, Spider-Man, just kidding, Dustin Gage. Uh, ninth grade girls, y'all are with Robin. 10th grade boys, y'all are with Jacob Ostell. Where's Jacob? Oh, okay. Y'all be with Jacob right over here in the back. 10th grade and 11th grade girls, y'all are with Meredith Rushing. Uh, 11th grade boys, y'all are with Sam. 12th grade girls, y'all are with Miss Amy. And y'all can gather over here in the back. 12th grade boys, y'all are with Dane. Y'all can gather right over here in the back. So I'm gonna pray and then y'all go discuss, confess, do life with one another. Talk about what is actually going on. We'll be back together and worship in like 15 minutes. Y'all have plenty of time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for what your passage teaches us, what it challenges us with. Um, Lord, this is, this is something that is, uh, it's not a one-off, it's not a rare thing, Lord. This is a daily thing, an, an hourly thing, something that we do every minute of every day. Father, the thoughts in our heads become the words from our mouth. Father, would you give us the wisdom to properly identify where we stand to properly communicate your glory. And if Father, if, if our heart is separated from your scripture, if our, if our language is different depending on the situation, the circumstance, Father, would you make it known? Would you convict? Would you change for your glory, Father? Lord, we, we cannot do this on our own, Lord. It takes being transformed from the inside out for your spirit to be made known, Father. Would you begin that process and continue that process tonight? for your glory. God, we love you. We thank you. We ask that you be glorified in these conversations in this time of just confession and doing life together and properly looking at where we stand. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and go find your groups. We'll come back together in 10, 15 minutes.